So maybe we should start with introductions. I have called the meeting to order at 6.04 p.m. And we'll begin with some introductions. Uh, Jen Laundry, Hardwick Elementary Board, and I'm on the amendment committee. Sam Friend, I'm on the Lakeview Board and uh, also the amendment committee. Catherine Ingram, I'm on the Hardwick Board and also the amendment committee. John Miller on the Lakeview Board and uh, the Amendment Committee. I'm McNeil, I'm on the Greensboro School Board and I'm with the Budget Advisory. Joanne LeBlanc, Superintendent. John Smith, CFO. Ori Zanesworth, uh, member at large for Hardwick Elementary and I'm on the Amendment. I'm Stephen Murphy from Woodbury, I'm on the School Board and a member of the Articles Committee. Kim Sill. Woodbury School Board Budget Committee. Tanya Thomas, Greensboro School Board and Budget Advisory Committee. Kevin Moore, Hardwick uh, Elementary School Board Budget Advisory Committee. All right, thank you. Next item is to approve the amendments from the com amendment committee of December 27th. You all have packets, they do have the minutes in there. Have I make the motion to approve the minutes from the amendment committee on December 27th. Can I have Catherine. a minute to peruse yep. them, please? Yep, you can peruse them. Second. Make the motion, Jennifer Laundry, a seconded. Any discussion about the um, minutes? Nope. No other? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Kevin abstains. Tanya abstains. <laughs> Motion carries. Rose, come join us. Okay, the next item is to approve the minutes from the budget advisory group from January 7th. Make a moment. Go ahead. So moved. Second. Kim, Kim um, made the motion. Kevin seconded. I'm trying to help their scribe here. He doesn't know everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, any discussion of the minutes? Nope. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? One. Abstain. Abstain. So we've got four abstentions. Five. Five? No, I, I didn't say. I said yes. Okay. Sorry. McNeil, Jennifer, who abstained over here? Stephen, Orais, and Kim. And, and Sam. Me. And Sam. All right. Um, motion carried. I got lost there for a minute. All right. The next item on the agenda is public comment. So I'm going to make sure we get all the public here. Is there anything? I want to make sure we have Chip Triano. We've got Kaylee. You can't see everybody there. <laughs> and Beth McCores. And who else do we have? Reeve. Reeve. Uh, and Pat was here. Where did he go? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Pat. Pat. Here. Oh, there he is. I couldn't see him. Fairs. Fairs. F-E-H-R-S. Jeff. Yeah. F-E-H-R-S. Pat Pennick. Anybody else I'm missing? Victoria. Yeah. Rose. Okay. So Rose, you wanna just try to introduce yourself, that's it. Sure. Rose Modry, um, on the Greensboro nope, sorry, Lakeview School Board. And I live in Greensboro. And you're on the budget advisory group. And I'm on the budget advisory group. And I'm Victoria Von Hesser, Chair of the Lakeview Board, Budget Advisory Group. Okay, so we just approved the minutes. Is there any public comment? None at this time? That's um, the press. Mike? Mike. Mike, Mike Lowski with the Gazette. Right. Do our TV crew want to introduce themselves? I'm Elizabeth Marsano from Hardwick Community Television, and this is. I'm Griffin All right, moving on. 
we will proceed with the updates on the budget, uh, small schools grant, building ownership discussion, timelines. So this is a meeting where we're going to do the budget on the first part, and then we'll shift to the amendment articles. Okay. So in your packet, um, John has prepared several items, and we can certainly put it up on the big screen if we need to, or you can just use these documents. I think it would be beneficial for everybody else to see it. Okay. And we do have some extra packets here, too. I could get that my packet. Oh, not, I do need to add one thing to the agenda, and that's executive session for personnel. For both, for um, everybody? No, this will be for the budget advisory group. She barely got home. So All right, so a couple things to start out with. Um, after uh, yeah, some discussion, the state board no, you're fine. has said that Lakeview and Woodbury will both be eligible for the small schools grant. So in the estimating file that the state gave to me from the AOE, um, they're estimating that Lake Views would be 97,163. Can you just stop for a minute? They're trying to follow in the packet. And that's not the first page of the packet. Mm -hmm. So this is the document you should find. It's about the second page into the third page into the document. And we'll say FY20 revenue draft. OK. You're going to see that? Okay. Yep. Can I ask you a question about the small schools grant? I'm mm -hmm. not super familiar with them, but do, is that a year by year? Yes. Like maybe they won't give it to us next yes. year? Right. And is it because they change the is they change the metrics constantly? Well, or no, are this is a, them out anyway. This is the first time they created a metrics to follow. Okay. Because of the merger discussion. It? Okay. In the past, it was just we'll given, to given to you. Okay. And budget. so, is it at all possible yeah. that they could say, they never mind, if for instance, that out. bill that was introduced <laughs> about delaying the merger until yeah. next year goes through, could they take this away? Or are they, is this like, I don't think so, because so? the, the state board has approved these schools. Okay. Okay. There's, there's been a public meeting, and they publicly approved okay. these schools to be deemed eligible. Okay. What happens if the legislature grant? doesn't fund small schools? Could they do that? Legislature can do all okay. Okay. whatever they I mean, want to do. I heard Dan French was in there asking for budget adjustments, which could mean anything. Right. So. <laughs> Pardon me. So, it's a day-to-day -day thing yeah. at this point. Yeah. I would think that if they were going to retract that, that would not be very good at this point. But this was publicly kind of announced that they're okay. doing this. Okay. But these I'm schools talking were future in a public years. meeting okay. um, last Wednesday. Okay. The state board approved these schools to be el deemed eligible for the small schools. Okay, grant. thank you. Okay, thank and you. in my discussion with Brad James at the AOE, he sent out an Excel file last week and said if the schools are deemed eligible, plug in this, and this will tell you approximately what to estimate for your small schools grant. Stephen, yes. do you have a question? Do you know what criteria we use to determine eligibility for the small schools grant? Yeah, there's a defined criteria around um, what is it? The well, there's your performance, performance. your uh, staff to student <clears throat> ratio, poverty. Um, they didn't, in the group that they approved, they didn't include geographic isolation, but that is one of the other mm -hmm. variables. There have been uh, points awarded for merger. Um, and 
know I'm missing one, but I can't think of it. Those are the, those are the, those are the big ones that carry the most weight. Okay, thank you. So I've plugged those in, so they are showing up as revenue. That totals just over $179,000 in additional revenue that wasn't in the file last time. What? Oh, there it is. You don't have the whole thing down. No. Okay. No. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not showing up, right? Screen isn't down. All right. So what page are you on? So this is going back to the first sheet, the tax calculation sheet. Okay. Everybody on that page? Yep. Rose, did you get a package? I'm looking on, but I'm oh, also we have, have here. Oh, I just gave up. No, it's fine. Oh, we can look on and I can find it. Mm -hmm. okay. So, <laughs> after first thing I need to do is apologize for my shock and awe last meeting. So I had plugged in the percentages based on verbiage that was in the file. I assumed it was one column in the AOE file. The percentages were calculated on and it was actually one column over. So these are the revised tax rates. You'll see they have come a lot closer to what people should have expected them to be. They're up here. Yes, they're at the bottom. Um, so there's no, you're not seeing that big disparity that was shown in the last file. So my so apologies have, for that. So for people trying to find this, this, if you take the numbers on the far left, which his screen isn't showing, it's number nine, actual homestead tax rate. They're highlighted. But they're at, well, they're not highlighted. It's just above it. No, no, but I mean, I mean they're bold. They're bold, they're yes. Bold. They're bold yes. numbers here. Mm -hmm. So it's nine right there. He's the showing. section right here. And do you have last year's tax rates? I, That's coming they, up. Do. Okay. We do have, okay. We have a I'm a jumping paper. the sheet. Yep. Okay. So I'm, I'm just trying to point out some of the differences in the file just so we can have a conversation and then you guys can follow how things flow through. Um, some of the changes from the last meeting. So those percentages changed, which impacted the tax rate. Those percentages live right here. Under seven. Under seven. So these are the percentages that changed and they drive all the tax rate calculations. So those were updated. Another thing that's been updated uh, is this base ed um, yield calculation. Uh, the state has given us a new number. It's now 10666. It was 10220. Um, so this is their best estimate as to what this tax yield should be. Um, so it is up a little bit, which does, it's a, good thing. It's a positive thing for your benefit. It benefits your tax rate. It makes your tax rate go down. Um, so that was updated in this file. So those things have been updated. Um, what's that? Threshold. The threshold, as you can see now, with this, all of this in here, you're now at 17,911. Uh, so you're $400 per pupil under the threshold, or basically $144,000 under the threshold. And that's changes. equalized pupil, right? Yes, four hundred dollars per equalized pupil under the threshold. Well, I just want to see if there's any questions to the, at this point so, so far. So, if if for some reason in this, if for some reason the schools were not the schools were not given the small schools grant next year. That would wipe out that 144. I mean, it would oh, yeah, be it's over basically the because we got the small schools grant that were under the threshold. Because threshold. you got the small schools grant, yes. That's the, the major contributor, okay. yes. There, are, there have been a couple other changes um, since then as far as we've had two staff members um, let us know that their intention is to retire at the end of the year. So we have made those adjustments in here. It's on the back side. Um, yes, on the back side of the last two lines. Um, and we have factored in a replacement of what that would be. Um, but you're, you're going to see about a $32,000 savings. Can you, ex I'm sorry, can you explain what the, I don't understand what the BA plus 30 slash M step six 
Does so that that's just or not? that's just we're taking on the grid. We're picking someplace on the grid, uh -huh. and we're basically picking okay. midpoint of the grid uh -huh. to replace the to person replace that retiring. person. Okay. So this person that was retiring is up on the upper side of the grid, uh -huh. and we're going to pick somewhere in the middle of the grid. And that's what we're going to budget for. Okay. And we're going to budget them to have a family plan for insurance, mm -hmm. uh, so that you're covered. So and that's the budget is within. It's already in that. It's in this calculation. It's in this. Yes, okay. it's in this version right here. Okay. And the things that are on the side are things that are not on the budget. These so are things that are not. These are items for us to consider as we go through the budget discussion. Or anything. Or else. anything else that you might come up in this discussion. These are just some ideas that we had that things that you guys may want to consider as we go through this process. Okay. So John, are these so I, cuts? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. In, in, no. In order to achieve this budget for 2020, each school or combined would need to spend 85 percent of what we had no. budgeted for 90. No. No. no, no, no. This is a this is a full budget. Okay. The 85 percent would be if we didn't pass a budget. Correct. Then the state will only approve 85 percent of. And the that's what this budget. upper. Thank you. That's what this right here. This is what that impact would be. Full time. If we had, if we did, we're not able to pass a budget by June 30th. We'd have to. If we had to go to an 85 percent budget, we'd have to cut 1.2 million dollars. So we went through to each one of the schools and said, okay, what would that be? And the only way you're going to get there is with staff. So that would basically mean. Ten teachers at Hardwick, three and a half teachers at Lakeview, two and a half teachers at Woodbury. I mean, you get the basically six, sixteen teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody. But when does this we happen? still if no, no, no. we don't pass a budget. If we don't if we pass, pass a budget, budget, we have to operate eighty-five percent of last year. If you don't budget. have a budget by June third, okay. by ready for July one, uh -huh. you by state statute you operated eighty-five percent of your current budget. Until but you can pass you pass until you pass until you pass until you pass, until you pass. Until you pass. But if we pass a budget July third. Then it doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Right. So you essentially you would riff, right? Is that what you send out, or you riff you ten teachers riff and then you and you then pass the budget, no and then you what. yes, you okay. have to you have to make. I mean, the only way you can achieve the kinds of numbers you're talking about is personnel. Yeah. Right. I see that. Right. So you'd have to you'd have to you'd have to riff per you know. You'd that's have to riff. The worst case. Scenario. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. I mean that's yes. we, if you're going to be talking about this, you should be talking about the left hand side. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, right. So. This was yeah. just okay. a request of the budget advisory group at our last meeting. Yeah. Right. To say due, what would, due to the shock what would that off. impact be? Right. Let us know. Well, regardless of the shock impact, that if you don't pass a budget, this is yeah. the current reality. That will be the reality. And that's based on this budget, not the one you had before. No, that's because this is based on FY19. Because we don't budget. have one. Okay. Have okay. Because we don't have a budget. Right. Okay. And just so you'll know, the AOE has not clarified this completely. This is the, I, I have asked the question, and uh, this is kind of the thinking, but this has not been set in stone as to how they will address this. Okay. So. This is just a what Kevin. If. Kevin. So, not to go down the rabbit hole too far, <laughs> would we be violating state statute if we were at operating at an 85% budget? So would we be cutting at services that were in potentially in violation with the articles uh, of amendment? Or sorry, the amendment articles, whatever, whatever it is. The ar draft articles, thank you. <laughs> would we be violating any of those at an 85% budget? So would we be able to continue services at all schools, continue current services at all schools? Would we be able to keep all three campuses open with an 85 percent budget well the, that's a decision that people will have to make because this is what your reality is you're basically i mean that kind of limits woodbury is at four teachers you only have a teacher and a half left to operate right. lakeview yeah. that'd be another teacher they'd have two teachers you'd only left. have possibly two one teachers left one and a half teachers left so and the chances lakeview are pretty good pretty that we'd be violating yeah violating state law to say. <coughs> yes, Victoria. So you know I'm going to ask. How difficult is it going to be if you have to pull this apart in so, the different 
if, if the legislature does say yeah. you guys need to do X and Y. So for just FY20. let me show you an example okay. so that you guys can see what I've done. Like all the principals put in their department yeah. requests. I'm sorry? All the principals submitted their department okay. requests. Yep. So I've put them all in here and I've got everything broke down by location and all the okay. tables behind the scenes that feed things in. Need that. So I can pull this apart. Okay. Uh, I'm sure you saw that one coming. <laughs> and I, and I've, I've had sure that then. intentionally built in here from the start. Yeah. Every one of these tables I've intentionally built this way from the start so that if we do get to a point where this gets, there's a stay or the legislature decides that we're going to punt for a year, we can pull these apart and we can have meaningful budgets to you guys to have discussions at your individual boards really quickly. Okay. Do, do we have we gotten any word? I know that, that that bill just went in to be read, but do we know at all what the feeling is about when it might be? Well, we have, we, could, we have, we have a legislator. Do you have any information on that about when we might know anything? Um, this is I don't know when you'll know anything. I can tell you that um, the delay is gaining traction. Um, there are more members every day that are interested in it. We you know, drafted a letter to leadership and asked them to join us. Um, so uh, it will depend on, somewhat on the governor as to what he has to do, but um, we think that um, it will be effective to uh, put this out one year. And, and, it's, and it's gaining traction, as I said. Okay. I, think, I think it's going to work. Okay. Thank you. Does, do we know if there's anything with the, um, if the delay would have any effect on the lawsuit? Or is, we don't Just know anything. Just more time. Well, the, more time to do stuff. Yeah. Okay. The delay is being asked for so that the legal appeals can work their way through court. Okay. Trying to back out of the situation that we're in right now um, after, uh, if the courts decide there's a constitutional issue then it's going to be even messier than it is right now. It's going to be really bad. So um, that's another piece that's starting to, to come about. Thank you. Yes. So we'll go to, to this page here that shows the comparative tax rates. It's like the first sheet. It was, of course, it should be in the front of the packet. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So basically, what I've done is taken each one of the entities, or each one of the towns, and taken your FY20. I wish I could blow this up more on the screen there, but if I do, I'm going to start losing well, we stuff. we have it in front of us. Um, FY20 versus FY19, and showed you what the actual net change in your tax rate would be. Um, so, for example, Greensboro, with this preschool comes into the elementary side, so there's no Greensboro preschool budget in FY20. So you have an elementary tax rate and a secondary tax rate, um, which comes gets you to a dollar seventy. Um, if you compare that to last year, Greensboro had a preschool tax rate of three cents. An elementary of 73 and a half and secondary of 93.6 cents which is a dollar 70 39 so Greensboro is basically flat year over year from a tax rate impact um, you go down keep going right down through you can see Hardwick's down basically two cents um, standards up 12.4 12.5 cents um, but the difference there the shift there is the, the disparity in basically standard students, the number of standard students that are in elementary school versus the number of standard students that are in secondary. So basically right now you, there's like 10 kids in high school and there's like 20, 30 kids in elementary, so. But their elementary budget, their elementary tax is most of the increase as yes. opposed to, yes. okay. Yes. Yep. So their secondary doesn't change very much. It actually went down a little bit, and most of the changes in their elementary, mm -hmm. just because of the percentage of students that they have in the uh, elementary level. Uh, Woodbury, um, actually, you see a, a net decrease there in both secondary and elementary. Um, 
and that's due to because of the, the shift in population among the kids. Um, so you're seeing a, a negative tax rate of eight cents there. No the positive. Area. It's going up. Oh no, it's going down. It's going down. Yeah. So this one down here shows you it's going okay. down here. Okay. Okay. Can I ask a quick question about standard mm -hmm. on the on the pre K FY nineteen? Is that accounted for in the elementary? It's actually accounted for in their secondary because okay. I can't pull it apart in there. From the yeah, okay. because they're two. The standard one was their two were built together. Right. And it's all tuition. As long as it was there, yeah, I just it's wanted all, to make sure it was actually yeah, there. <laughs> it's all in there in tuition dollars. Okay. So they build one budget. So I just I knew that going in that it's not. There should be a piece of that that is preschool, but there's I think there's what one kid. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Just accounted for. Um, I'm a glutton for punishment, so I read the November 28th State Board report, cover to cover, to see what was going on because I thought it was interesting and intriguing just from the legislative point of view. But it stated that the reason that they could do this merger with the three schools, the four towns, is because Standard was not supposed to have had pre-K in their school board. Yeah. And so from going forward, will standard preschool be part of the new district yes. and not part of the standard mm -hmm. board? Correct. Same with Greensboro. And same with Greensboro. Yes. So Greensboro will not have a school board per se. It'll just be the new district elementary yeah. and the Hazen Union yep. reps. Yep. Okay. Yeah, but standard will still board. have the two school boards. Yes, because they'll still have their seven to twelve, seven to 12 only, tuition. and then that's it. This board, then this yes, board, representatives board. on yep, this yep. board. Okay, just wanted clarification on that. Yep. <clears throat> so from everything else, the files have pretty well stayed the same. Um, the only real changes has been those two retirement announcements um, from last month to this month, and then my correction of my wrong column in the Excel file. So Hardwick and Woodbury have retirements? Hardwick, yes. At okay. this time. Yes. At I this could, time. Okay. Those are the ones that we know of at this time. There may okay. be more. I mean, um, if this budget were to be approved at this board, uh, and it were to go to the voters, what would the ballot say for uh, equalized pupil spending? It would say the 17 9 11. What's the percentage of increase year over year? I can't give you a percentage of increase year over year because the entity did not exist. So, what's the ballot say? So, what does the ballot say? Because the well, ballot last year said not yet. We so, that the, the language, guidance. we haven't gotten guidance on the language yet. Okay. So, that we have, I have asked that question of Brad James and, mm -hmm. and the finance team to say, okay. What do we tell them? And the, the direct answer I got back was, there's no comparative data to compare it to at this point. So you so can't. You can't know how they can answer. They don't. The they don't really know how they how to answer it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Do you foresee the small school grants um, staying as is for for three years, five years, or do you think they're fading them? Do you know how long they've said that we would keep those? We've been told that they're fading them out. Yeah. Um, there's no real definitive answer to that, but um, certainly within the next few years is what we've been doing. Maybe Chip? Three years. Three years. Three years. Mm -hmm. Within three years, we'd yes. have to add. Well, is that for everybody or just each us? Year. It changes each year. The, 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 change, the amount changes every year. Will be phased out okay. Three years. And it all, it all depends on where your equalized pupils are at your elementary level. And it's based on like a two-year average, so that number changes based on your elementary population. Okay. For these schools. It's just good for the amendment yeah, committee absolutely. to know that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's something to for for you guys as a board, you need to be thinking about that and planning for that to say, okay, in three years we need to be ready for this to not exist. Right. And well, would we even qualify next year if our new yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. It's by the building. It's by building. building. Oh, so it's, it's by, by building site. and not by, by site. Yep. new district. Yep. Okay. John, is it possible for you to um, get the current year um, estimated or the current year equalized spending per pupil for the three schools so that we could compare this 
if somebody said, well, what was Hardwick's last year? Or yes, absolutely. If you could get that. Because yep. that would kind of answer Kevin's question. Um, I just spaced my question. I apologize. Give me another moment. I blew your to mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 3.84% increase uh, on the budget is what I'm looking at. I'm looking ahead a little bit. Does that include the collective bargaining agreement uh, yes. adjustments? Everything. Yeah. Okay. Everything's in there. Health insurance increase. Victoria, did you have a uh, It's okay. I'm just thinking about what happens next. Really, nobody here has any authority to vote on this budget yet. So no, really no. It's kind of like we're kind of just having discussion. a discussion. Still discussion, and yeah. then after February 19th, assuming that meeting happens, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> um, I would assume this group would reconvene as its official transitional board of meetings. But this group is so only it's approving, if I read the articles right, to present a budget to the new district we're board. We're not even a transitional board yet. There's oh, been okay. No organization, but even with the oh, trans, they don't have any authority. So, the, but the transitional like board <laughs> will approve a budget to <laughs> present <laughs> to the new board when those people right. are elected, right. yes. and then okay. they will approve it and present it to the voters. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. We're just advising currently. Yeah, yeah that's right. Just with a bag committee. Bag so committee. should we? <laughs> so should we talk about the items that are not in the budget? Yes. yes. That's next. So, or what else, whatever else you want to discuss. We could start this conversation and then you guys can take it wherever you desire. Um, so we have a couple different things we would like you guys to consider. Uh, currently, under this new entity, you're going to have three campuses to manage, three buildings to manage. Um, we really believe it would be beneficial to have a facilities manager. This proposal would convert one of the FTEs from a custodian to a facilities manager and then um, move one of the part-time FTEs from 0.3 to 0.5 so that we ended up, uh, move them up by 0.3 so that we ended up with 5.0 FTE across the new Union Elementary District for custodians um, for the three buildings. The total estimated cost of this change would be $30,582. And that would give that facilities manager a salary of $65,000. And then they would be in charge of managing supply ordering, projects, scheduling, uh, scheduling of, staff. of staff, everything to do with the custodians and the building maintenance within the three buildings. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts around that piece? Currently, uh, Jeff is doing that. Correct? Currently, Jeff does is a 0.1 at Hardwick, um, so it's it's minimal, minimal amount of time. And who's doing facilities? in this budget? There's nothing. Who's doing facilities at any of the other buildings? Really, the principals end up taking it along with the custodial staff. And so, has that been the way it's been working for the past eons? So and if the working, effect, working in quotation marks, it's not been working. No. Yeah, that's okay. that's the pieces that hasn't been working. It and probably has in one school. In all fairness, yeah, Woodbury. Woodbury has a unique individual who's their custodian over there who is has got a lot of skill sets. And Lakeview's had a lot of part-time yeah. pieces, which makes it hard for anybody someone to who isn't consistent for the entire day doing it makes it very hard to keep up with everything and I mean your lead person does food service and part custodian so he's only a point two yeah. custodian and so point eight food it, service it's, it's not their fault it's just it's challenging and has this been something that the three principals have said they would like to see well you got one sitting here what do you think, Patrick? Two. Two. Well, I didn't see you come in. What do you guys think about? I mean, if, if we are going to be one entity, it does make sense to have a facilities manager that overlooks all the buildings and kind of do the watering, and manage projects and resources. So. Okay. Any further discussion on this? Any other thoughts? If, if you add this into the budget, what does it do to our per pupil spending? So let's go put it in. But it would still keep us under the threshold. Yeah. 
if this were to happen, would this be someone that was hired in house, or would you put it out? Well, it says that we would convert I an have FTE. To technically, when we have if we create new positions, I'm legally required to post. Yeah. So I can post internally first, yeah. and then I need to post externally. Yeah. All right. Can you give me just one second? I want to do one thing first, so you guys can Especially see. Getting the qualifications to make yeah. sure that whomever is doing it has yes. the capacity to do it, so you right. don't end up in a situation where you've got yes. a great person but who doesn't really understand anything right. about the system. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and this way, you guys will be able to see what it does impact on the tax rate as well for each of us. Um, so if we go up here. Yes. This so goes from 17.911 to 17.996. And you guys all go up a fraction of a penny. What did it go to? I didn't, wasn't quick enough to write. 17.996. And you all go up less than half a penny on your tax rate. And in theory, there's long-term savings in terms of not having but uh, unexpected budget issues when buildings haven't been mm -hmm. maintained as, as well as they could be or some somebody hasn't realized that, that there's some issue. need or issue or a safety thing that has to be dealt with like immediately so yeah. and we think I, longer term there could be also additional savings um, buying collectively um, buying right. supplies and sharing services and resources across the three buildings right so. makes so, sense to play the devil's advocate what happens are like because I haven't ever done any of this what happens if for some reason one of the buildings closes or we don't continue using one of the buildings how difficult would it be to reduce this person's hours? I would assume that their hours would go down if there are not three. If there I are would not buildings. assume that this person necessarily would go down. Okay. I would assume that we would probably realign the custodial staff and duties accordingly. So that the custodians would be reduced as opposed to the manager being mm -hmm. reduced in time. Because you're still going to need that person there okay. taking care of the two buildings. Okay. Um, and to keep this type of a person on a part-time position, you may find challenging at best. Okay. So would this person also do custodial work? Yeah. So it's not just building they're management. Not, no. They're going to be an active custodian. They're going to be an custodian active participant. As I mean, well. there'll be times where they're actively participating with the custodial staff, and there'll be times where they're actively out there um, so doing RFPs for projects, doing paperwork, doing requisitions. Okay. But so it's, it's a multi. Multi. Yeah. Okay. Do you have an estimate of how much time will be spent on each portion, either doing custodial or doing RFP type work? So, are you thinking this person's going to be 50-50 manager? No. no. 20 80 Like, what are you? It'd probably be closer to 80-20, maybe a little higher, maybe 90-10, uh, especially to start with. 90 being the, the management. Management. The management. The management. The management? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. Wow. So because the there's not, there's going to have to be a lot of systems put in place. There's, there mm -hmm. hasn't been anything in place for these guys. You're going to have to, you know, bring these teams together. Yeah, fair enough. It's going to have to be relatively short-lived at a 99% management level. So. Initially, just to yeah. get this yeah. off, it's going to take some time. <clears throat> and just to point out, even if one of the buildings does close, the new district still owns that building. Right. It still, has to, still has to maintain it. Yeah. Yeah. Until it's until you, turned, the, the, something else happens the with it. The district sells yeah. it to whomever the articles say they're going to sell it to. Okay. But even if you close the building, you still own it. Yep. Okay. So you, take care. you don't just walk away from it. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the agreement, articles of agreement, it can be turned over or sold. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's going to take time. So yes. You yeah. have to maintain it. Especially yeah, it's not like, like you can't nice just, weather. You can't do it. <laughs> do yeah. like you do your house and just shut the just water shut off. Shut the water <laughs> off. No, you can't. You can't do that. So. Okay. So that's if we include 
if we that's the impact if you included that position so let's just keep going let's say we let's say we there's a decision that you make that says you're going to keep it we'll leave it there for now let's check out the other categories so the next one we had was a food service director this one is becoming more and more challenging um, there's more and more of a requirement for paperwork for fresh fruit and veggies for all the USDA stuff that has to be filed all the time. Um, the food service side of it has become very administrative heavy. Um, I think we have a principal out here, Amy, who might agree. I would agree. Um, and Brittany Curry, who's a staff member of mine, actually does a lot of processing of paperwork for the school so that they don't have to. Um, so we think there's great benefit would be to actually have a food service director that would take care of all of the grants, take care of all of the processing of paperwork, take care of all of the filing, um, which prepare would meet, pre prepare a menu prepare schedule menus, for the month. Um, take care of all of the administrative side of food service as far as scheduling the staff across the, the new Union Elementary. Um, so there's three different options up here. One would be just to convert one of the FTEs to a food service manager and not to hire any additional staff. Um, that would leave a huge hole, I think, um, but it's $12,407. Um, the next option, option two, would be to convert that FTE to a food service director and then also hire a 1.0 FTE um, staff person, and that's with full benefits and I'm assuming a family plan in there um, just for budgetary purposes. And that's comes out to about $58,000 for those two pieces. So you basically, it's the increase of the food service director and then also the addition of a new staff member. And then option three would be to um, upgrade the one of the food service managers to a food service director and then add a half-time person uh, with benefits. We're looking at about $34,000. So how much... Um Hardwick currently cooks for Woodbury. Yeah. What do they have as far as food? a food person at their school? So they have somebody that comes up and picks it up picks and goes up. down and serves it. And is that what is that full one one FTE, half time? What no, is, what it's, is, uh, point, it's point it's point three something. Point three? Point okay. three three or something like that, yeah. And Lakeview has a Lakeview has cook. somebody on site that cooks more. And it's gym. just a one yeah. FTE? Point eight right now. Point eight. And Hardwick has two three FTEs, three FTEs. Three FTEs. so so I mean I guess one of the things that I had heard talked about was having all three schools on the same I mean obviously Hardwick and Woodbury are already on the same menu correct mm -hmm. so if the if we put all three schools in the same menu is there any has there been any conversation about having the food all cooked at Hardwick and delivered to both schools since it's already happening at one of them? Or is is what, is what Lakeview, I, this is just a question, I don't know if that's something that's being discussed or talked about. Is there enough kitchen space at Hardwick to do three, three campuses? I mean, if there's enough kitchen space at Hardwick to feed all the kids, well, <laughs> right. then I, I, think, I think one of the More things kids. might be to ask Amy, who's been involved in this, as to how this has worked because um, I think the issue is the transport is one of the issues, mm -hmm. and then you still have to have personnel at the site right. to do it. Of so. course, Amy, how has this worked? So right now we we order yes, in the loud. We order in the morning. Mm -hmm. We um, it, it's it's messy. Just okay. So you know, like it's it's messy because it's hard to not have food service on your on site. Right. Um, so we order in the morning, we pick up by 11, we can bring it back, serve it, we have to kind of package what's left over, it takes some time. Um, we try to rush back to have it before they're shutting down their kitchen so that the cleanup can happen okay. on site at Hardwick. Um, it's also messy right now in terms of the, the managerial pieces of it because Val is not contracted to do all the ordering for us. She orders for the meal parts, but there's other parts that we need that she's not responsible for, managing all the grants that come mm -hmm. through. It makes mm -hmm. it really messy. So it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge for sure. Okay. We, we've made it work because of staffing. I mean, people are open-minded and trying to make it work. 
And how does this, and the, the current budget that we're looking at right now continues that same model on for next year? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, I don't know who's first, but Victoria. So, um, we had talked a couple, like a year and a half ago, about subbing, subcontracting this part out to another service, mm -hmm. that that was going to be an option that we'd look into. And my other thought on this is that while it may seem really um, financially beneficial to have one central kitchen preparing all the meals and then shipping them out. It sounds that from a preliminary review that that might not be the most efficient, but also just to remember that each of these buildings have their own personalities and their own um, atmospheres and initiatives that they've worked really hard to build. And I think that in our case in particular, we've done a lot of work with Green Mountain Farm to School. We've put a lot of work into our food program, and I think to dial that back now and, and have it rolled into coming out of a central kitchen uh, and a satellite space where our kids are in the kitchen regularly doing meal prep and mm -hmm. learning how to cook, that would be detrimental to the kids in, in the Lakeview building, I think. So I would, I would caution whomever is going to be putting together this final budget when you're looking at things like this to really think about the individual schools as their own personalities as well. And even though we're looking at a big budget that's going to have impacts on, on all of our communities, they are almost like home for a lot of these kids. So if you go and you make big drastic changes, the impact ends up on the, on the little kids. It doesn't, you know, that's, that's, I just want to caution everyone. No, and I wasn't suggesting that we should necessarily do that. I just had a question is if Amy's person, whoever it is, is having to rush back to Hardwick so the kitchen doesn't close, is a little more communication between Hardwick and Woodbury so that, especially in the winter when the roads are terrible, you don't want someone rushing because I got to be there by five minutes of one or two minutes of one or whatever. Mm -hmm that a little more communication and working it out and then in future years if that does continue then contracts can be changed even within job scopes to rectify that issue and work it out rather than just kill it because it doesn't appear to be working you know if the kids are happy with the food that's one thing but if it's just the managerial part of it and that seems to be the issue then I would encourage not being on the budget committee that uh, something be looked into to rectify those issues. Actually, I appreciate your comment, Victoria. We do feel the pain of not having our own kitchen in mm -hmm. our school. I want to be clear about that. We were doing a lot of raising our own, growing our own food on site and cooking, having kids cook in the kitchen. It's much harder to do that when you don't have all the materials to do that. Um, you know, there's just something said for having food cooking in your building. Um, that just that just the smell alone, quite frankly, changes the whole um, climate. So we feel the pain of that. Um, we're trying to find creative ways to counter that by having volunteers come in and cook with our kids. It's not an ideal setup. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. So I would encourage future thought about how to maybe improve that program. And, we're, and Val is incredibly accommodating to us, or I, just to be on the record for that, like, yeah, we have to hurry back, but she doesn't, there's no danger to anybody in that process. We have a pretty decent communication system where we can figure out the parts and pieces. Rose? Just in thinking about what you've both said, um, Amy and Victoria, and looking at this, it would seem to me hard to justify adding the salary for somebody who's in a managerial position when we don't have the staff um, who are on the ground cooking. <laughs> I mean, to, to say we can't have a cook at Woodbury, but we could have somebody at an upper level managing the system, to me, seems like uh, hard to justify. I, would, I, I wouldn't feel good about that choice, that we have somebody who's just overseeing it and pushing the papers and managing that part, which I totally get is important. But to say, well, we can't really afford to have a full-time cook, we have a point eight, or we can't afford to have a cook at Woodbury, but we've hired somebody to, to manage. I would have a hard time justifying that from a tax 
tax perspective. Did Hardwick hire anybody or increase anybody's hours to account for cooking for Woodbury? There was some increase in hours. How much? Do you know how much? Not very much. I think it was an hour added. To it was about a about a half hour for the two employees. For the two employees. An hour a day. So hour a day. is that point one? I don't know how that ends up with the STE. Five hours a week, so. Yeah, so yeah, it's about point, 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 one, point, point, one, point one, point one, point one, two or three. Yeah. I wonder, has there been any savings achieved through centralizing the, the production of the food for Woodbury? Well, I thought that was why they did it. Wasn't that, was it to cut the, was, had, has that realized savings in your budget for this year? We're not seeing any savings. I don't, see, savings. I don't no. see where it's realized any savings. Um, but, you know, there are other factors as well as to why some of those savings haven't materialized. So the original analysis didn't include a, a transport person, but that was deemed necessary to make the program work after the fact. Um, so you're, the, the original plan had current staff. current staff picking up food and bringing it down and current That's staff serving. serving. Um, but it was deemed that that, that didn't work, um, so that we needed to actually hire somebody to do that, so that ate up a good chunk of the savings that was So basically what you're saying is that they could have their kitchen back mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it wouldn't change the budget at all. Or it would minutely well, change. Impact, it'll impact the Woodbury budget because they'll have to. Right, but, but if you're part, part, part of this budget and you're moving it, yeah. Well, no, we were talking about some of these. Yes. It would, you would be adding. You'd have to add a 1.0 1. FTE to well, I don't know if they had a point, 1.0. I mean, if, if Lakeview has a point, point, point eight. Eight. Point, eight. Point, eight. point eight. Point eight. Yeah, so you'd be adding a, a, point eight. a point eight cook. But you'd re be reducing your transport person as well. Yeah. And then you we wouldn't be, have the, we'll yeah, there wouldn't be that there'd much. There'd be no transport yeah. And there'd be right. no bill back. No Harvard. bill back. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. So it's a, it, it's a net wash. Yeah, it's a net wash probably. Yeah. Right. I, I wonder. There's really not a huge amount of savings. It, it appears to me we've got two issues here. You've got production of food in the kitchen, providing food, and then there's the administrative work in writing the menus and the grants and filing papers. Is it possible instead of instead of creating a position for a director to have somebody else um, take care of the administrative work for all three kitchens, it wouldn't necessarily need to be a full-time position. Is that possible? And, and if so, who would do that? Well, well I can I just, just yes. the current reality about hiring staff, the labor market's really, really tight. Um, so to find people who are willing to work part-time positions makes it even that much more challenging right now. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's a challenge um, to get people who would do the job and do it well. Um, might be a challenge. I'm not saying it's not impossible. We can't evaluate it and see what can be done. It's just those are the realities we're in right now. Our labor. Did, did you mean more like that we already have the central office staff? It, could it come under the auspices of somebody in that position who's already employed who could be able to take on these papers and figure out how to incorporate that yes. into their position. Yes, someone who's, who's already in an in administrative the position. Yes. Right. Yeah. And yeah. maybe they could supplement their own. Yeah, at Hardwick, uh, Val takes care of all of our paperwork. Yeah. She's very expert at it, very trained at it. So, you know, the one option for us, we already have somebody that, that can do it quite well. And how can we then spread that expertise across the whole district? Looking for versus bringing someone that's sort of outside in that, that hasn't had the experience and the know how. Yeah. So, and then to, to free up more of Val's time because she also helps with her deals, then we would, you know, we would need someone part time and we said hard work if that was available to do it. Thank you. Did you have a question? I did, but I'm going to. All right, just a clarification. I knew Val was doing it at Hardwick. She's been doing it a long time. She does an excellent job. But is it necessary that? Are you saying the manager, food service director, excuse me, um, would need to be full time for the three schools, or is would she still be cooking? Would she still be running the Hardwick kitchen, but just and then hire either a half time or the full time to, or nobody? Um, your three options here to assist 
somewhere, but she would do all of the bookkeeping part of it for the three schools. Yes. Yes. And then also do some cooking. If because your first if your, your first option is to hire no additional cooking staff. So and I, that's why I said that I, I believe that would leave a hole in the kitchen. Okay. So if we hired a half time then or even a full time that went between you can't really go between two schools as kitchen help because you've got to serve at the same time. You're prepping at the same time. So it, right. But if you hired half time in two different schools or part time, how much of Val's time is she currently cooking? Compared to her management time, I, I would have to check with her. It's, yeah, I, don't, that, I, don't I would be know, curious yeah. on that, yeah, that and then you would know how much you're losing. Yeah. Because if yeah. you don't know how much of her time you're actually going to lose, and yeah. what the hole is, then you don't know if you could get away with the half time or the full time. Is that kind of like option three? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. only one half time. One half time one person. Half time. But right, I realize that. But if you don't know how much of her time you're actually going to lose, right. and then you said it was a wash to go from Hardwick back to Woodbury, I mean, I'm just trying to wrap so, around it. So just to get clarity, um, just a couple of things I've heard here, um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's almost a conversation of putting a food person back into Woodbury School, and that's like a point eight. And basically those individuals have been called food service managers, so they're responsible for their own paperwork in their own buildings. Lakeview does that, and currently, um, well, Woodbury would have done that, and currently Hardwick does. The notion was because the demands of this work continue and that takes time away from their responsibilities to actually cook and prepare and also to try to have, um, if you're going to have one union uh, elementary system, then your meals should be pretty consistent across the system, what you're serving. doesn't mean you can't have the, all the programs that you have, but you should have one common menu that you're serving across the system. Um, so having somebody who can coordinate all of that, um, order, every, do all the ordering for all three of the schools, um, take care of all the federal requirements as well as the state requirements, which change every year. Um, you need somebody who has a pretty good skill set with yeah. that. And just, just ordering food alone, Hardwick can order stuff by the case. And just to give you an example, because Faye's yelled at me, Crassberry a million times because when she orders a watermelon, it's like 13 bucks because she orders them one at a time. When Hardick orders them, they order a case and they're like three bucks, four bucks a piece. Kevin so there's a huge Gary. amount of savings to order. So you lead right into what I'm asking, going to ask about. Yeah, has there been an analysis done about potential cost savings for centralized ordering? No, I've had no time to do that with the budget okay. process. Do we have a back of the napkin type of estimate? Could we save 10 percent? Could we save 20 percent? Three percent. We could probably we could probably produce an analysis yeah. at this time if that's the request of this group. Um, I also want to just point out. Don't mean to cut everybody off, but we are at almost seven o'clock, which is the first hour of this meeting. Um, so I like to give it just a little bit more time to get through the third bullet, and then just <laughs> ask for some direction that people want to go, and then we we'll go into the amendment. That yeah, I'll, I'll keep it real quick. No, no, that's fine. Wait, um, I was just wondering, since Crassbury is facing ordering issues, that why why a food service person? I, I know we don't like to add people to central office, but if in the future that isn't like an SU-wide position. Absolutely. Right. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's that kind we of, are, we, yeah. That's I a discussion that's that been, yeah. We're not there yet. Okay. okay. This would be kind of a stepping stone. Okay. For yeah, that. I kind of feel, I mean, my, my personal feeling about this is that, like, if we don't have room to add stuff to the budget, that, like, maybe the schools just continue on as they've been. Ideally, we should have the same menu for everybody, but if we aren't there yet financially, then maybe we wait and see if the SU can provide a food service director Sorry. and we're ordering for the whole SU. Because if we're going to save money, or you know, I mean, you Sorry. save money the more you buy. It's, okay. it's your call. And then we just, just to add context, so that we still do have 
the logistics of getting it because they have to deliver to one central location. Mm -hmm. So we do have the logistics of then getting the materials. But out. we would have that same problem with if we were ordering right. for the, mm -hmm. and we have the three schools. So. I, I, I get that. I get that. I right. just want to make sure that everybody's aware of that, that the, the cost savings isn't going to just be what you save on the food, then you have to factor in what it costs you to actually distribute, distribute that food. Are going to give the kids little red wagons? And we're going to have, like, you know, the hazel <laughs> walk from, from That's Parkwood great. to Greensboro? Okay. That's great, but yeah. days, like, days, like days, like today, days like today, I think your, your vegetables are going to freeze. Kevin, this is how we create top Vermonters, <laughs> right? So, I, I think the general consensus is more analysis is needed yep. around the food service yep. uh, conversation. Okay, so that's where we'll head. Um, Nursing services, one last or a couple. So this one here, um, we're having, we're seeing a considerable uptick in children that have uh, needs around nursing services, um, especially um, diabetics. That's become a huge issue in our schools. Uh, so currently we have, Hardwick has a 1.0 registered nurse and the other two schools have a point two nurse so they're in there one day a week point one and point two um, so the suggestion would be to keep the 1.0 RN but then add a full-time LPN so the two of them can facilitate all of the children's needs across all three buildings um, because honestly like right now at Lakeview you have a principal who's monitoring the diabetic needs of a student. Um, and that's not an ideal situation. Um, we really should have these services for these children. So uh, just personal opinion, if we don't have proper medical professionals administering medication, I without question think that we should. Um, I, I'm not sure what it looks like on the ground at Woodbury. We just heard an example at Lakeview. I'm not sure how you know you figure out things on uh, a day-to-day -day basis with a 0.1 or a 0.2 FTE uh, medical professional. Well, everybody's medical professional train the staff on how to administer medication. Where's, where's the legal liability go if something goes wrong? What's on the licenses, unfortunately, of the nursing staff. But because you're not required by law to have full-time nursing staff in small buildings. I, I it's know. based on student count. Yeah. Yeah. Carter Elementary, last I knew, could actually get away with a 0.8 nurse. So mm -hmm. the state creates that liability, mm -hmm. so you have an out. Because if you follow state standards, Hardwick has too many nurses. Well, the issue is, is that there has been an increase in the number of students that are type 1 diabetes in all of the schools all in this session. And there are specific requirements that when a child is diagnosed, then for the first month until they can level out, you must have a full-time individual who has some training in nursing there every day to monitor. Follow-up question based off of that. Um, how many support professionals do we have assigned to children with medical needs that could potentially be filled by a medical professional being in that building? Um, Well, that's a tricky one because um, unfortunately sometimes there are certain cases which require you to have somebody there regardless if you had a nurse there just because of the severity of the situation. Well, understood. Um, I can't give you an exact number um, because there's so much filling in between principals, administrative assistants. I mean, they're all covering. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't really have a clear answer for you, Kevin. This one's a no-brainer for me. I mean, the, the impact over the entire their entire union budget it's going to be it's minimal. It's like what, yeah. 0.3 cents? Yeah. yeah. And and the other part is, but is that, that still won't put those schools at a full-time person, will it? No. No. But, but um, this is something that we also see at the SU that I've discussed is having a lead nurse at the mm -hmm. SU level and then having a cadre of nurses that can move around the district mm -hmm. um, so that wherever there's a need, you can do it. And also, the lead nurse, if you have it ideally, if you have a nurse that's absent at Lakeview, that lead nurse can go and sub. Mm -hmm. 
you know, so you have the flexibility to move the personnel around if needed. A lot of the nice thing about this too is with this 2.0 model, um, a lot of the children that are on are type 1 diabetics, their monitoring devices hook up to Wi-Fi networks, so they can still monitor that child remotely. They don't actually have to physically be in that building, and, and they could prescribe something to a principal and say, hey, this dosage needs to change. And or this direct, would, an or direct an LPN to, to get there. And things can be done, and, and it gives you the flexibility to move people. They can see a, a kid, you know, something's going on with his monitoring in Lakeview, but then the LPN's in Hardwick, and change the LPN and send them up to Hardwick to take care of that child. Uh, it, it just gives you a lot more flexibility. So what is the, to kind of sum up, what is the direction from this, the bag group, <laughs> budget advisory group, as to next iterations or next paths that you want us to explore? I've heard an analysis of food service. Um, do you want, we kind of put in what it would cost for the facilities manager, and it looks, sounded a little bit like the nurse's got kind of a calculation of what the nurse might cost you. I don't even know if you're at a full penny yet, if you add that. If you add the nurse, you're probably close to a full penny. So if we go up and add that in. But if you added all three, I did some math while he's doing that, um, and I took option two because it was the most expensive for food service, you're still under threshold. Oh, yes. And I'll, I'll show you what that is just so you guys have. So this is adding the, the nurse. Um, you're basically... Um, standard hit a penny, everybody else is under a penny. For, and that's having the facilities manager and the nurse. And then if you went and you added the food service at the highest level, just so you have what it is. You've, you're still under the threshold by $21,000. And you basically Standards up two cents. Everybody else is up about a penny and a half, roughly. But you don't mean under the threshold by by twenty. Yeah. You couldn't be under by twenty. No, you're 000. under one by fifty-eight. You're under by twenty-one thousand dollars. It's which is fifty-eight. Fifty-eight dollars. Oh, you're looking at that. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so we're both right, Victoria. Eighteen. <laughs> so it's like you can't find three. The threshold by twenty-one thousand. I mean, you have no spending. <laughs> <laughs> So that's just, just so you guys understand. That's where, the worst it could be. Yeah, that's if you went and took all path. three options and took the food service at the highest level. It, does it change the 3.84% to what? Uh, does it, is it more than 4% at that point over uh, year over year <laughs> budget? I'm still concerned about what shows up at the ballot, even though we don't understand what that looks like yet. Yeah. Well, Let me yeah, it's important. Can I share this back with you? It doesn't pass. Excuse it doesn't me. mean that. No. 393, is that accurate? That's the what, that's what it is now. I got 384 on the sheet you printed out. Oh, at the bottom of the sheet? In your budget sheet. That's what you do. 3.93. 3.93. Oh, is that what you're looking at, Trevor? Oh, sorry, what one was I looking at? Uh, that side of the general yeah, education. 3.93. Yep, 3.93. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, this. This. Yeah, that does the same thing. That's a synopsis. Yeah. So it's... This is our... Yeah, this is the... Oh, okay. Synopsis, and this is the whole budget. So it's basically... goes from 3.93 to 5.78. But that's working off of the merge budget. Yeah. Yes. But if yeah, you break it out, I mean, if you're asking mm -hmm. for hardware, like for Lakeview, we're at 16.459 this year, right? Mm -hmm. And if you go up to 17.911 without any of these options on the right, that's an 8% increase. Right, and we were so. at 16.937. I don't know. I don't know my math well enough okay, to do that percent, percentage. I didn't do it. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> and this is comparing you're, you're the proposed budget to, to the people. current right. total of the FY19 budgets. Yes. Okay. If you combine the FY19 budgets, That's this is what the percent increase would be. 
be 5.78%. About what the town I heard it come out. Just nine percent. If I'm just looking at if I'm looking at the Harvard budget. And the tax rate would go up about a penny and a half for Hardwick in Greensboro, and Woodbury, and then Stanley. Well, I know, but they're still gonna it depends on what yeah. they say on the ballot. They made it different anyway, but they still said it in a bad way right. three years ago. I know. So, or two years ago, whenever right. that was. Like okay, so what is the direction of this group as we six. need to move on to the amendment? Is that, is that it? The analysis for food? Ponder what we've just talked about. Um, you've seen some numbers here. Is there Are there any other things you would like? Us to consider or think about or do an analysis on? My take is it's pretty well covered, but I would be reluctant to meet again as a bag until we're officially a group that can actually take action. That, that's what concerns me is we keep moving these decisions forward, but we haven't actually vetted them with the other boards. We haven't had, you know what I mean? Like formally. That's so that all discussion. If, if I think on, a, on the surface, this is really informative and we could learn more of it. And that's why I've, the only yeah. changes I've actually made to the template is just been those two retirements. Right. That's the only changes and then fixing my math mistakes. Yeah. I just would like the next time that we get together to have a group that could actually act on it instead of speaking hypothetically. Okay, so uh, that's my. Do you want the analysis <coughs> sent to you as members, or do you want to meet? I mean, you're not. You're probably if if we have the organizational meeting. I think I've timed this to almost be the very next night right. for this group to meet because there's going to be a short window, so right. we have to meet almost immediately. So, do you want to wait until February 20th? I just, I just I feel comfortable with that in part because there's a lot of information in here and you've given up us a lot and that the pieces that are missing are are pieces that are extra analysis but that we could that I personally feel comfortable with waiting until the 20th but whatever the date is but so it's a pleasure of the rest of the group. I'm kind of in limbo as well at this point without understanding what the ballot language looks like, what that equalized pupil language looks like. We may have that like. by then. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't give a thumbs up or down on anything at this point. Uh, anyways. I mean, uh, you know, even as an advisory <laughs> thumbs up or down, um, it, it's tough. Uh, I think we're in a much better place than where we were two uh, weeks ago. Two weeks ago. That was, that's an understatement. Um, I, I'm not sure what else we could accomplish. In, the next couple of weeks without having some sort of authority to do so. Okay. I'm kind of with Victoria and I'd rather the next meeting where we can actually make decisions. Joanne, do you have what you need to do um, contractual obligations from that board? Um, I don't have to deal with any risks until April 10th. I have to notify staff by April 10th. So by then, I would hope that we are into the new board by then, and we'll have a clear idea of where we stand with the budget. Um, and contingent upon whatever happens, if, there, if this moves forward, then we'll go from there. If it doesn't, then we have to address whatever's in the individual budgets and we'll make decisions there. I, I feel pretty confident that there'll be some answers enough so that you can make a decision whether to riff or not riff before it's okay. Joe, and this is totally off topic, but um, number 16, you have a typo. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not a numbers person, I'm a words person. <laughs> so, just, just missing a C. It says school board. School board. School board. School board. <laughs> You okay. took my job. Oh, all right. Did that. So, Kim was on. Um, Rose, any thoughts? You're on. And Tanya, you guys are part of the budget advisory group. I guess I, I was just thinking about the nursing position. Um, I, and I, I would second what Kevin said in the sort of initial thinking that obviously safety is of the utmost importance and student safety. And um, that, that sounds like a, initially a great. Um, thing to add. I think a lot, the same as with the food service piece, I'd love to see a little bit more analysis, like what would that look like? How would those two roles play out? Like how would they, those two people split their time among the three um, buildings? What would the, that look like in terms of hours? I, I think that would help. I, I don't 
plus See, travel time. Yeah, and travel time and just how, how that would look. But I, I don't have any opposition. Like, as a, as a person, I think that would be uh, an essential role. Tanya? I thought. Um, I don't have anything to add, no. Okay, and I would agree you? with what Victoria and Kevin indicated, that we really need more information before we can okay. make any final decision. Okay. So at this point, we're on agreement. We're not meeting again until after the organizational meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will close. Uh, does the public have anything to say regarding the budget pieces? Beth? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cole I'm trying to wrap my head around. So what I heard the last time from the meeting that I went to was that Woodbury maybe possibly didn't own their building, so there were some different configurations that we could look at there. Um, I'm trying to still piece together and trying to think long term about sustainability that we're trying on the short term just find a few cents to make the budgets look even to pass it now but I'm really worried about the long term and even in adding these positions because once it becomes one budget in one district Hardwick being the percentage of it that's biggest is going to have the biggest financial obligation with our taxes in the long term so I'm still trying to figure out are we still looking at three different buildings, and that's what we're going ahead with, or are we looking at other possibilities? So I, I guess that was one of my questions. And then just as it relates to like these positions, for example, you know, Hardwick right now pays for the full-time nursing position that's in their school. If we're adding on those positions that are going to be in other schools, again, we fit a bigger percentage of that budget. So in essence, would our taxes be supporting those positions? Now, you, you guys may be able to answer those now or you might not, but I'm just really encouraging these boards because for 10 years, with all of these merger pieces, we haven't been able to come to collaboration. And I hear the idea of we have our own flavors in the schools, whether it comes to food service programs, nursing, curriculum. But I'm going to say as a staff, um, as a district, you know, the professionals that work in it, that we all are very collaborative and can work it out. I sometimes think it's the kids and the staff, and it's maybe not always the parents that can accept the changes that need to happen as quickly as the kids can. Um, I also heard in the last meeting there were maybe some issues with Lakeview in the buildings, um, and especially the work that needed to be done on those buildings and what was going to happen with that in the budget. I didn't hear any discussion about that tonight. Again, I don't know what our of those towns planning on doing all the work to their budgets before we merge, or their buildings before we merge. I haven't heard any discussion. And then loud and clear was at the Harvick Elementary was the auditors came and pretty much said there was zero wiggle room, like zero, and that we don't have any savings anywhere. That when we go towards this new merge school district budget, which we are doing, no matter what the configurations are, that there is no savings when something happens in any one of these buildings. So I'm really nervous about adding on positions when we don't really know how to manage that now. Okay. So we take an input, uh, Kevin? Um, I, I just want to piggyback off that a little bit and say I, I think generally speaking we're waiting for more information both from Lakeview and from uh, Woodbury about the status of those buildings. Um, I, I don't know if we can answer those questions at this point, Beth. I, I think that information is still Coming there. Um, It'll be in the but, articles discussion, I right, believe. But um, it, it, it's, it, it's something that would have to be discussed as soon as the, the next meeting happens, um, based off of the work of the amendment. Okay. All right, with that. Can I ask one question? Sure. Um, have the current food service managers been part of any of the conversations so far around these scenarios related to changes in the food service program. And it's not, I would just advocate for them to be directly invited into the conversation. Some of the questions you have, I think they would be the ones who could answer the most. Um, I'm having all of them at the office. So they are called to me. No. Oh, okay. I invite them all in from time to time to talk about things. <laughs> or eyes. Constructively. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna <laughs> so shift three, gears. Yeah. I'm gonna shift gears for the next uh, 40 minutes to the uh, amendment committee. Um, yeah, everybody's been talking. <laughs> I'm sure that's cool. Sure, but I just wanna 
focus on that. So um, the first document you have is the last piece of work that the amendment committee did on December 27th. Well, we didn't do anything on the 27th. This was the 20th. Sure. It was a week, well, it was the 20th. So this is where we had left off. Um, I can pull things up, but I figured we'd start there. Um, these were all the kind of discussions that we've had. I've included a transition timeline FAQ, which has some guidance around the transitional board and the amendment process and when the um, transitional board needs to warn the amendment committee. Um, John had sent some other draft language, um, so I've included that email. And then the last document is a series of questions that um, my office put together and sent to the AOE um, <laughs> regarding a number of things that had come up. Um, and there is the Articles of Agreement, which was about school closures. And there was also um, about conveying buildings. And then one of the other things that was discussed was also this group had talked about how you would elect what happens if, uh, regarding the election of board members and, um, voting on a budget and can you follow the current uh, format that you do for kind of hazing so that there are answers to those in here um, as to what the AOE guidance is. Um, and also, I did clarify with Sean Tui um, some of the responses of the AOE. Um, so I'm not sure they were completely clear. Um, so I do have his, I, I can tell you what his response is. Wait a second. What? Woodbury isn't on the, build, the land. Are they on the 14 acres? That's separate than That's the land separate that the, than building the, land that the building's on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes perfect sense. So why don't we start with, why don't we start with some of those questions? Um, Stephen is here. Um, maybe you would like to bring an update on where we are with the discussion around the, the building and the land on which the building is on. Yes. Last Monday, the select board had a meeting. And at that meeting, the board and members of the public and some members of the school board, including myself, discuss the implications of the town of Woodbury owning the property and the possibility that it would not convey the property to the, um, to the new union district. And we discussed this at, at, the, at the meeting of the articles committee to some extent on the 27th of December. Um, and just to inform everyone else, would the town of Woodbury has uh, has owned and operated the building, the, the school building, in cooperation with the school district since 1914. There's a long history and tradition of education in that building. Um, and naturally, there's some, uh, some reluctance to conveying that property to the district. So um, Joanne informed us at the meeting on the 27th of again some possible implications that could come with not conveying it and in my understanding if if a school district does not convey the property they may forfeit rights under the default articles of agreement specifically regarding enrollment in the school building um, grade configuration and protections against closure within the first two years. So this, uh, this new information spawned some very, um, uh, very serious discussion among our town um, regarding the conveyance of the property. Um, so that was Monday at the select board meeting. Tuesday, the school board had a meeting. It was a special meeting. Um, and again, we, we resume discussion on, on that subject. So I will inform folks here that Woodbury, in, in my opinion, um, based on what I've observed, that the town of Woodbury is now considering conveying the property 
in order to protect our rights and uh, rights under the articles and to improve the education of our students, not only within the town but within the district. Our um, Woodbury is very proud of its school. Again, we have a long tradition, but we have good reasons to be proud. The, we have a community ice rink next to the building that's get, that gets used in gym class. We have gardens, we have a greenhouse, we have woodlands, we have wetlands with trails, we have an outdoor classroom. Uh, we have a community library that's separated by the school only by a swing set. That community library supports the education of the students. Um, we have a, an after school program. So, we believe that bringing Woodbury into this district fully um, would benefit all the students. Um, and I'll add in, in uh, we mentioned this at a meeting, I did. Woodbury school building is, is over 100 years old. And at the same time, due to diligent and prudent management, it's in the top 25% nationally for energy, energy efficient schools. In, two, I believe it was 2013, it was one of, I believe only 11 schools in Vermont that was awarded a gold star by the Environmental Protection Agency for efficiency. Um, and finally, in 2017, within the entire OSSU, including Wolcott and Craftsbury, the entire OSSU elementary schools, Woodbury had the lowest education spending per equalized pupil and the highest scores in SPAC math, SPAC English, and the K-2 reading assessment. So, we are very proud of our school. I think for good reasons. We can bring a lot to this district. We can improve this district by the inclusion of Woodbury. So, I believe that the town of Woodbury is inclined to bring this question to the voters. In order to sell the municipal property, the voters of Woodbury would need to approve. So based on the discussions that I've observed and participated in, I believe this question will be put to the voters. Do you wish to convey the building? It would probably need to go be conveyed to the Woodbury School District and then under law, if these articles of agreement are, are enforced in July 1st, 2019, under law, that property would be conveyed to the new union district. So that's where we are today. Thank you, Steve. The other question was around Lakeview and the fact that grades four, five, and six are not on the campus, but are um, through an MOA, Memorandum of Understanding, um, being provided down at the town hall. Do you guys want to discuss anything further on that? Um, I think we've had some discussions about uh, tightening up the MOA to uh, to make it so that it's a a, a, a binding legal document, and if the new uh, new district is implemented and there is a contractual relationship between the Lakeview School District and the town. The, uh, presumably the uh, new district would have to behave in a lawful manner and honor that contract. So that's one way of doing it. The other is to create a sort of a, a circus atmosphere and pull all the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders up into the other building, shuffle space around. And that's not really good for kids, and I think we're more reluctant to do that. So we're looking, I think, at tightening up our uh, contractual language with the town to, uh, to make that sort of circus unnecessary. And that sort of segues into some thoughts I had uh, and made recommendations in my latest email to the uh, amendment group, because there's nothing in Articles three and four that specifically requires you could easily take that transfer to the district out of there and simply 
make as a condition of the article operated during the uh, calendar year, which would solve the problem should uh, the vote fail in Woodbury. Uh, that language would make it possible and would maintain the same protections that we had before. Um, one other thing that sort of ran with that thought was that we might have to add a specific language in Article 7, which supposedly AOE says we can't mess with. But if you add language a couple of sentences to the end of the article, you haven't changed the article, you've only added to it. Uh, and that would make it just simply very specific that, you, that all contractual relationships for uh, educational use of uh, third party owned buildings and facilities would be honored. Uh, if we can't play that route, then the, the logic of having a good type contract uh, uh, would uh, place the owners back on the, the new district if they behave in a, in a lawful manner. John, I have a question. Um, then you've done. Okay. It says on page 10 of 12 in the document Joanne gave us, which is our synopsis of where we were, these articles cannot be amended if you, and as a town moderator, if you add anything to an article, you have amended it. Okay. Therefore, you cannot add, in my opinion as a moderator, carrying the same rule of thumb here, you cannot do anything to Article 7 because you would be amending it. Yeah, it, it's not essential. I think, uh, what would I say? It would be nice to have, but it's, it's not a fatal flaw if it's not there. But your input is appreciated, all right? So okay. No, if we can't go there, we can't go there. Um, but uh, making a good tight contract with the town that the uh, new district would have to honor uh, would uh, would cover the gap as long as we have the uh, operated instead of transferred language in Article 3 and 4. Those are suggestions. If we yeah. have operated instead of conveyed, what's the state, is there any like legality about spending taxpayer money on buildings that we're leasing or don't own? No. Oh. We don't actually they don't pay lease. for upgrades in the You in don't, town but home. Woodbury does. Woodbury was planning to. <clears throat> I'm sorry, planning Woodbury to. was planning to put a new roof on the school, weren't they? I mean, like, as far as I understood it, would, like, I guess I was a little confused by the conversation, what, by your comment of, or your statement that the town and the school board have, like, sort. it, it sounded to me like you were saying you kind of co-owned this. I had understood no. from the 27th yeah, no. that you guys didn't have any idea you would know the, own the building. We, I believe we have conclusive yeah, it's clear that Decision the town now. of Woodbury owns the actual building and the three acres of land on which the school building lives. Right, so, so the, but the board, the Woodbury board, has been paying money to maintain that building. Yes, which and is against the Which is law. against the law. Well, law. it's state statute state, and okay. no one knew Right, that. no, I'm not So I just want to clarify. Right, okay. So. No one understood that there was, until this merger came along, no one really paid attention to it. And there's always been an understanding that since the school was operating, that they would take care right. of the building like anybody else does. And now that we have new information, as Stephen presented, the board and the town have discussed this. And the town is, is looking to have a vote to work on conveying the property to the school district. If that, should that occur, then the school district will have every right to expend its funds. So if we do something like John is suggesting of saying of any school building operated by a forming district instead of conveyed, Can't do it. How, does that, how does that affect the legality of the union board spending taxpayer money on a building that they don't own? Can we still- Again, Catherine, I'm gonna stop that conversation. I'm gonna pull my moderator hat. Article 6 is non amendable. You cannot change a single word in that article. This is an this article, is article 6. Three. This is Article 3. But if it's not conveyed, then that's the only way you can talk about a building because everything understand. else from Article 6 would go back to Article 3 and talk about how we got the building to the new school. I, 
May I, I believe John's proposing a change in the language in Article 3 to include buildings that are not conveyed yeah. in the case of yeah. Greensboro or Woodbury's vote does not. Yeah. You can either own or operate the building or both. This doesn't say, so Article 6 does not say you have to convey any buildings that students are in. It just says that, it just talks about buildings that are conveyed. Right, and so if you don't the, convey the building, then you don't have to follow any of these other rules. But because article, there's no building conveyed. I checked with the state board. Right, but Article 3 comes first, and it's talking about, it's talking about attendance and, and, and restructuring of grade configurations for the academic year. And so what he's suggesting, what John is suggesting, is that instead of saying... his email. I read his email. So instead of saying school buildings um, conveyed, I'm sorry, I have to kind of find this. I cannot restructure the... It's in Article 3B, Number 2. So in academic years 2019, 2020, it's not in here. and 2021... It's in Article 4 shall not restructure the grade configuration of any school building conveyed to it by a forming district. So we would say conveyed or operated is what John is, right? I'm, just, mm -hmm. no, I'm substituting operated for conveyed to it. But um, then how would that affect hardware? Because we are conveying it. Why so should we? So. If they don't, why should anybody else? Because we own it and we can't become part of the, that is the thing is that in. You own and operate the building. We, this is, this is where the, this is where this is sort of the rub is that there would be districts that would be conveying their buildings like Lakeview would be conveying basically half of the buildings that the children are going to school in. Woodbury would in potentially not be conveying their building and Hardwick would be conveying their building. I'm not taking issue we can't change Article 6. I think that that's clear that if the school board currently owns the building, we would be conveying that building as part as becoming part of the new union board. Am I, am I correct in that? So yeah. my question is, if there is, for instance, a memorandum of understanding or a lease agreement, is there any legality with, with that new union board saying, okay, we're now going to ask the voters for money to replace a roof on a convey, on a leased building or would that fall to the town of Woodbury to maintain that building? I don't understand the difference between the between a leased building and an MOU to use it. I, I assume that Greensboro maintains their town yes. clerk's building. Yes. Yeah, we yes. don't maintain it. Right. Do no, because Woodbury like pays nothing towards any repairs that have to be done at the Greensboro Town Hall. So then, has there any, been any conversation with Woodbury about if the voters reject <clears throat> conveying the building, is Woodbury prepared to maintain that building for use as a school building? Because the, we won't be able, will we be able to spend, we won't be able to spend taxpayer money on that building Correct. to maintain it. Yes. We, we haven't got there. We Okay. We're considering conveying the building right. because we understand the gravity of this this situation. That if we don't convey the right. building, then we may forfeit our right to but educate. But you don't know how your people are going to vote. No, that's correct. But but this is why we're having the discussion. Correct. Initially, okay. it seemed the sentiment um, was to was to maintain ownership of the building. Mm -hmm. But then we received this information that from Joanne at the last meeting. That was presented to the, uh, the select board. There was a discussion there, and then a meeting at the at the, at the school board special town meeting. We're we're starting to understand that if we don't convey in this, I, I, I'll also just remind us that at the meeting on the 27th of the articles agreement, the two members from Hardwick expressed their opinion that if Woodbury did not convey this property, that the voters of Hardwick may oppose enrolling students in in Woodbury. So these were all taken under under advisement. So we're 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 trying to ensure that Woodbury continues operating and that children from Woodbury and the district have the opportunity to attend school there. Right. That's this is a difficult conversation in our town, but we are we're working through this. That that's why we're here. Right. And and yeah. I'm just trying to understand the gravity of changing conveyed to operated by. And that was sort of my question, was just like, if we say operated by, I mean, can we really spend any money on an operated um, building where students are going to school? And, and if it's fine with Greensboro, and they're going to maintain that building, 
then I don't necessarily see a problem with that. But I guess that. Go ahead. Uh, my take on this is now that Woodbury is aware of the constraints, should the uh, transfer to the school district fail, they are now aware of their obligations. It's, pure, it's a simple wash. Uh, and all of that language does is uh, remove an impediment. Because we're really living on the cusp between either we fix the articles of agreement or we fall into the language of the default. The defaults are restrictive and, and would be very harsh on Woodbury as a re that's you know that's why I was thinking how do we well wouldn't it also affect Greensboro because they could they couldn't have the kids in the uh, town hall then they'd have to be in the elementary school yeah mm -hmm. if, and we talked at our last school board meeting about if we have to do that that's we are able to, to it's not advantageous to our students but we can do that okay and there there seems to be a peril in not in not coming in with conveyed property because we I, I don't know how how the the new union district board would administer these lease contracts I I don't see anything in here that would compel them to well actually you do have well, six is compels you for the year articles six. article 7 continuity of contractual obligations for what duration do you know would that year. only be one year? Right. Yeah. Okay. And there is also um, with lease agreements, um, you cannot have a lease agreement longer than three years um, that the board can actually enter into a lease agreement for three years. If you go more than three years, then the electorate has to vote to agree on a longer contract than three years. So is it safer for Lakeview to have a lease agreement with Greensboro for that for the use of the Crown Clerks building than it is for them to have an MOU? Yes. Okay. Well, technically, there's going to have to be a change anyways okay. in the contract. Yeah. Um, they have an MOU, which is pretty clear that they don't expend any dollars. Mm -hmm. But an actual lease agreement is stronger than the MOU. Okay. So advising, they should probably have a lease agreement and um, just make it much clearer and tighter. <coughs> so it's kind of like MOU, lease agreement, and ownership is kind of the, the weight the level. Tiers. Okay. Um, but the part that's an issue, and I should have pulled up the um, actual statute that got um, ended up being sent to Woodbury, um, and I have vetted, if you'll notice in the there. I have vetted, um, watch, I sent it to the attorney and I have Sean's um, email regarding uh, the MOU for Lakeview. Um, it's in a separate email. Um, just asking from the legal opinion if it was, if it met the criteria of the statute that we're held under for, um, uh, you know, it's like you're not, you're not supposed to be, like Lakeview, Greensboro has kind of said you can use the property for this purpose, there's be no exchange of money and all of that. Well, technically, that doesn't meet the letter of the law. So we have to have a look. Whether it's a dollar or whatever, it's supposed to be a contract, not that kind of an agreement. So um, it's not a big deal, not compared to what Woodbury has to it's go through. It's not hard to change, is it? We just need to write a new agreement. It's yeah, it's just lawyers <laughs> tightening up agreements and making it a little tighter but it really wasn't it's not bad it just needs a little tweak yeah. so and that may be useful for uh for what they, if they, yeah, hit they end up in the same place yeah so so joanne before we even get into any of these articles have you looked and projected budgets for what? It would be um, two or three years out for, especially three years out without small school grants, and what our towns would be looking at for increases. Because for Hardwick, I'm not willing to change any dates on any articles without knowing numbers of what potentially that could do to our taxes further down the line than one year. 
because you've given us a lot of information about how to save next year's budget, but nothing about what it's going to look like three or five years down the road Well, when this comes about. When the well, the thing the is, is a lot of the articles you have are based on two years, what you have to do for the two years. Right, so but we were looking at changing them for longer than two years. Well, you were looking at Article 4 was a discussion that this movement had around the length of time. There had been a proposal put out Hardwick had put out a proposal to extend it to five right. years. Right, in Article 2, they were taking out the years altogether. Right, but that so. was before we knew there might not be a building conveyed, and that was going to cause issues, and that Lakeview didn't house all so, theirs. So I would, a recommendation is, is at this point, I would look at it that you're going to have two entities that will have buildings to convey and... I mean, that's the track you should follow at this point until such time that changes, things are changed because in both situations, you've just heard, those issues are being addressed. And so I would not get quite as hung up on that right now, and I would further discuss other things. As to projections, three to five years now, we just barely got the, the one year cleaned up here. So. Um, yeah, but then Article 2, it says the new union district shall operate schools for the grades in which they are operating in 2018-19. That holds us liable to always operate those grades regardless of budgets. And I'm not willing to take those years out if that's... Yeah, we can't just say for... I mean, that's... But Article 2 addresses the grades, so if, if this committee and the, the new union district believes that it's going to continue educating kindergarten through sixth, sixth grade. Yeah, but what if we send sixth grade to Hazen? What if we... So I've got Kevin over here to raise his hand. Sorry. So just a philosophical question. So um, observing the conversation uh, of this group, because I haven't been to any of the uh, uh, amendment, uh, uh, or sorry, the uh, amendment committee uh, meetings. It sounds like the general conversation is about keeping everything the same but with one budget. What's the benefit to that? How does that benefit our students? Just philosophically, how, isn't there an opportunity here to increase the, to increase the services we provide students if we can reduce costs somewhere? Is there, has there been any consideration uh, with this group about how this could potentially impact the staff recommendations, the administrative recommendations of collaborating on services and improving education and quality for everybody? We did, actually. Just yeah, better. sure. <laughs> Victoria? I'm not on the amendment committee, so I haven't. Neither is he, I, I mean, I can't speak to what they've been addressing, but I would, I lost my thought already, but I think Part of the reason we want to advocate for keeping things the same is for the students because a lot of huge transitions aren't going to benefit anybody if all of a sudden next year we're looking at a situation where the budget dictates that we close two buildings that's a huge change mm -hmm. and it's not just a sudden change for the students it's a huge change for a whole community and i i, I really I think everybody should just slow down, and I know we're all worried about about the cost of doing this, but I think stability is important for our towns. I think thinking about what the impact of this on kids and staff could be, and also looking down the road, if you're talking about closing two of these small schools, you're talking about basically shuttering two towns. So you might not have those students for your own schools either, the Hazen, budget will, will be impacted, the Hardwick budget will be impacted. It is in the long term, in my opinion, best interest of all of our communities to have those smaller schools open so that people are actually living there. If they're not living there, they're not necessarily all going to just come to Hardwick. They might go to Standard so they can drive to the other side of the mountain and send their kids to Lindenville. So I just, just keep that in mind. Want to, want to follow just yeah. wrap that up and, and so I'm not suggesting closing schools tomorrow this that's not what I'm suggesting what I'm saying is why are, I feel like we're shoehorning ourselves into forcing one way or the other yeah. 
rather than collaborating on this and understanding you know what those recommendations might look like so I'm not saying close schools you know starting July 1 that's not what I'm getting at but if all of a sudden we have an art program that's flourishing or a music program that's flourishing one location why not shift that if it's a benefit if there is a benefit to do so why not but if we are getting to the point where we're, we're putting ourselves up against the wall saying we can't change anything for two years or three years or four years because of budget considerations or because of these uh, articles, I, I, I think that's detrimental to our, our students. So first Stephen, then Catherine, and then John. So philosophically, I'll speak for myself and Woodbury, we don't want to cut. We want to grow. Mm -hmm. We want to bring that to the entire district, not to cut costs, but to attract students mm -hmm. and expand the population. And one of the most productive discussions we had here was in keeping three schools open so they could distinguish themselves and offer specialized opportunities. And one of the most, I believe, constructive conversations that we had in this articles committee was in allowing intra-district choice. Mm -hmm. This wouldn't, we're, the intention among this committee was not to remain static, not to overturn anything too abruptly, too precipitously, but to allow this district to form and to merge and to mesh. And this intra-district choice we were discussing would have given uh, students by right um, the opportunity to attend their hometown school while also allowing uh, enrollment in any one of the other schools within the district. So that's what we were talking about. Getting this, getting this district moving incrementally mm -hmm. and allowing each program, each school to distinguish itself. I appreciate yeah. that. And Thank looking you. constructively. Mm -hmm. yeah. Catherine? I think that I like the idea of having the three school choice um, but I do feel like we need to allow for flexibility within that. And I think that um, I agree with Kevin's feeling that if we make this too rigid, we're not going to be able to have good school choice. We're not going to be able to have flexibility to change things around if we must keep the grade configurations exactly the same if we need to make changes within things. And this is not, like, I really also want to say, like, we have to look at this as though we're all talking about this from a large perspective and not just from our individual towns. I'm not saying this because I'm from Hardwick. I'm saying this because I want the best education for all of the kids that go to all these three schools. I think choice would be excellent. I think choice would be, allow us to have some creativity. But I do think we also need to be very careful to not make ourselves. We have to operate pre-K through six at every single school because if we don't, then we're not following this. And if we're in violation of this, then I don't know what happens, but some big hand comes down and smacks the face or something like that. But I do, I see Kevin's point and I think we should really listen to it because we need to be careful about saying all or never because if we want to be flexible and creative, then we need the ability to do that. And one of, that was one of the reasons we stripped out the, uh, <coughs> or tried to <coughs> discuss stripping out the two-year status quo lock-in. Mm -hmm. We do not have that luxury of time. Part of it's budgetarily driven. Part of it's due to the strength of the programs. And uh, we want to move on to that rather than simply say, well, we can't do anything for the next two years. So that's part of, that's part of the logic behind stripping out those uh, that the, the, the two-year window. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you did have to say was, you know, what we had before, we have to go forward with that. But we're not locked into the, the two-year window. That I, purely as a third party, I just wanted to point out that I, I just see a lot of polarity happening and, and rather than collaboration. And I want to just get to that collaborative approach and make sure that we're, we're keeping that in mind as we go forward. All right, then that's an exam. Okay, I go back. Um, this is the first time I've actually come face to face with you, so it's nice to see you. I'd like to start with that. But if you take the years out, that means it never can happen. You can never change because it says in academic year, they will be there. Um, and it'll be the same for two years. That has to be in there 
so that we have something to start with. And then that means after the two years, we can begin to look at changing it. And I think it's going to take those two years. And who knows, in maybe three, the third year, we're going to leave it the same, or we'll all agree that it needs to be changed. And it would take a vote of the full new board to do that. And we covered that by saying it has to be a majority vote. And the majority vote is five. So the town of Hardwick, if you're afraid Hardwick's going to rule, can't rule on these big decisions. But the same with Article 4 in closing a school and changing, owning, conveying to operating. That's a big difference. And I think we need to look strongly at leaving the word conveyed because that is what the legal basis is on. And I realize Article 4 comes before Article 6, but that doesn't mean it's more important than Article 6. Article 6 says the school district that was in place before June 30, 2019, needs to convey their schools. And if the school is not conveyed, then anything that refers to it is different, does not apply, and needs to be looked at. This is really the first time I've seen your budget. You've had the option of the budget. The only reason that the budget is looking good is because you're getting the small school mm -hmm. grants. Mm -hmm. The legislature tomorrow can vote that you're not going to get that small school grant. And then you're going to be in a world of hurt. You've just looked at adding maybe 123000 to that budget to do some repair work that hasn't been done in the smaller schools um, and hasn't put a new roof on the building and hasn't, I, last I knew, Lakeview had issues too. Hardwick has issues. And those mm -hmm. are what's going ahead. And we've all got to deal with those. But to drastically change the word conveyed to operated to me is a major mistake without knowing what's happening. And I think that we got to do the same as the budget committee and not do anything with those until after town meeting and see what happens. And then maybe we'll have more legal wordage because in quickly looking through Joanne's emails, um, we have some other issues as well with the articles of agreement as far as the meeting that's coming up in February and how we can vote on different things and how one town elects and does budgets from the floor, Hardwick does everything Australian ballot, and how are we going to get it so that we don't know the outturn in the three communities without a sealed vote and those types of issues. And I don't think we're going to be able to come to any conclusion, at least not in my mind, until I know exactly what's happening with the Woodbury School and what's happening with the contract and wordage with what we can do with Lakeview. And I'm curious as to is there the possibility of just certain grades coming to Hardwick as opposed to closing an entire school and just bringing part of the population in to ease the issues with the budget in other schools and what room there is. And I haven't been through the school at Hardwick in a couple of years to know what the grade is. That's why I asked Pat earlier for a view. Because at one time, that school held over 350 kids with no problems. And they received their specials. So. Same. Um, just to, um, this has been a challenging discussion mm -hmm. among this group. I think we're all trying our best. Um, we all have, we have some very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you folks from Hardwick have noticed um, all the little like challenges of having a small school and how much we depend on a small school grant and how changing taking out a cook affects mm -hmm. your kids. Um, those are kind of things that don't affect a bigger school like Hardwick as much as they do. I can only speak for Lakeview. Um, but I am trying very hard as a Greensboro community member to protect the kids in our school. And I know we're looking at this as a Hardwick's the big school and Lakeview and Woodbury are the small schools. But my hope is that if we open it up to intra-district choice, that may change. It, and they may, I mean, I'm not going to say that Hardwick's ever going to be on the same level as Lakeview just because of capacity, but you may find the populations in those two buildings rising because parents are now given that choice to pick between the three campuses. So just, it has been very challenging. We're trying and we're making little tiny <laughs> steps, I feel. I think the last question and then we need to 
because we're at eight o'clock now. So Rose, oh, I think Sam Sam illustrated the picture that I was thinking about. So that was it. Okay. All right. So um, again, good discussion. Um, we have. So what is the pleasure of this committee? Um, I heard our rise make a statement of not to meet until after further decisions have been made regarding the properties. That's one voice on this committee. What's the rest of the committee want to do? That would be town meeting. Yeah. Well, I don't know that. Changes. I don't know that Woodbury is going to be ready for town meeting on theirs. There was some discussion, possibly, but it could be warned after town meeting before they can make their decision on their vote because they only had about two weeks to get things prepped. So, if I'm, am I correct? I was an impression that they thought they could have it ready for town meeting okay. day. So they may have an answer by town meeting day. I know they were working on it. Yeah. And this is a minor. Yeah. This will this won't take long yeah. to, to rectify that situation. So. But assuming that we're supposed to merge and be ready July one and have and I understood that what the desire of the budget committee was is that the budget advisory committee was that they wanted for us to move forward with changing these no with creating a draft to recommend to the new union board in july is that correct well the decision to have you all meet at the same time was because of the the impact that that budget had and it was also to have you be aware of what's going on from a budget perspective and the implications of it so you'd have some knowledge around where we stand from that perspective you do have a task. I mean, right now, none of this, based on the new language, the new directions and timelines, um, you couldn't hold an amendment committee. You couldn't vote on the amendment committee until after um, the organizational meeting and the transitional board are in place, because they need they would be warning this thing, this meeting. So, if you want articles to appear differently, then you need to have something before July 1, otherwise it'll happen at some other time. But you have to remember, right now, you're going to be deciding, I mean, right now you're going to follow the default articles with elections of board members. Whatever gets decided at the organizational meeting will determine the path. Um, if you want to change any other language or the configuration of your board, in all likelihood, if there's nothing that's going to, right now you can't pass anything before this happens anyways because of the time frame. So it would be kind of setting up the, what the future will like in the, in the, in the following year because I don't see how you're going to change your configuration of your board at this point. Joanne, you're going to want to go into executive <coughs> session for the budget. I only got 30 minutes. Yeah, oh, I'm getting there. Okay. <laughs> I'm just answering the question. So, okay. what is the pleasure of this group? Are we on hold until after the? <laughs> are we on hold until after the February 19th organizational meeting? What is that? A couple weeks from now? Or are we on hold? Are we on hold until after town meeting? If if the, if the, I'm sorry, but if the articles, if the amendment committee is supposed to be recommending a different draft of this to go to the transitional board, is At that some right? Point. I would rather work on it now than try to cram it in between yeah. after the 19th. But we can I, still talk about it. Why does it, it need to go to the transitional it board? It doesn't well, go to the transitional board. Yeah. It goes to the full board, the new board. It, well, it, no, it that's not. It, goes to the it doesn't. It goes to the voters. The transitional board, initial board, considers the work of the amendment committee and has authority but is not required to do any of the either their warning or pro warning proposed amendments in, or they don't. Or they can choose the board if any say, other board chooses. But if the transitional board, yeah. or not warn right. them at all. But if the transitional board is meeting, is they're being elected on the 19th. That's no, they're, they're being, being sworn in. Sworn in on the 19th. Right. So it would make the most sense in my mind that we go and assume that Woodbury is going to convey the building and that that will work. And if it doesn't, we can go back and fix it. But like, get through this stuff now right and then and then if we we're have, gonna have another 
amendment committee meeting, I want some projected numbers for our districts and what tax rates would look like if we lost small school grants. So also, I, I'd like to say it's my understanding that this committee is not required to to make recommendations to the transitional board, but rather it may, and likewise it may make recommendations to the initial board. So the, the vote on these, on amending these articles may come really at any time before Jan, uh, July 1st. So our timeline has been disrupted by this pause. Mm -hmm. So we, and I, in fact, I believe this committee has lost authority to, to, um, to advance we the, lost the authority to, to give these to the voters yes but the thing is that if the if we give a draft I mean the transitional board is made up of people who are on our own boards. yes so if we give them a draft of this and say we'd like this I mean this has in it what the new board will be made up of if we give them nothing it's not like they're gonna have the time to create this yeah, and change the number of people who are going to be on the new board. I think that this this is a lost opportunity if we don't try to work on this now and give them a draft at least because they're not going to have time to do to like redo this. I mean, this is a lot of work. But the transitional involved. the transitional board can present them to the voters. Right. Yeah. But what was the date of this document, Joanne? Your new transition last week. Last week. <laughs> okay. So dated January January 9th. 9th. Okay. So this is, you know, again, just rereading it. But you're right, and I take back what I said about town meeting. Okay. That, I think we should uh, work on this. If we can get this no. to the transitional board, who will be sworn in February 19th, right. then on February 20th, if they're meeting, they can approve the amendments that we give them, and they can warn for a vote in mid-March. Right. Okay. And then we and then have... We'll know even if they wait and warn it after town meeting to be sure that Woodbury conveys the building, we will have the document done. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think that right. would be a lot better than, yep. to, than to just wait. Okay. So we're going to have okay. a meeting and okay. we will pick a we'll pick a date, but I need to pull together the budget advisory group for an executive session. So Thank you will you notify everybody. us. Yes, I'll Thank I'll you. find a, a date so and you. move forward with I'll put out something. Okay. So I have a motion from somebody from the budget advisory group to go into executive session. Yep. I make a motion that the budget advisory committee go into the ex executive session <coughs> to include the OSSU staff people. Seconded. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.